dear colleagues, uh, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I am delighted to welcome you um, to, to today's lecture uh, as part of the 39th annual lecture series of the McLean Center. Uh, and, and as you know, this year's series is entitled Ethics in the COVID-19 Pandemic, Medical, Social, and Political Issues. We are so honored uh, to invite our speaker today, uh, George Annis. Um, professor Annis is a William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor at Boston University, University is the director of the Center for Health, Law, Ethics, and Human Rights at Boston University School of Public Health, and a professor in the Boston University School of Medicine and in the School of Law. Um, George Annis is the co-founder of Global Lawyers and Physicians, a transnational professional association of lawyers and physicians who work together to promote human rights and health. Um, Professor Annis has degrees from Harvard College, is an undergraduate, the Harvard Law School, and the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, he and I go back to knowing each other somewhere in the mid 1970s, or possibly the early 1970s. Uh, Professor Annis is the author or editor of 20 books on health law and ethics, including, I'll just mention a few, Genomic Messages in 2015, Worst Case Bioethics, Death, Disaster, and Public Health in 2010, The Rights of Patients, the third edition of which came out in 2004, uh, and this just goes on and on. Standards of Care, the Law of American Bioethics from the 1990s. Um, Professor Annis wrote regular features of law and bioethics for the Hastings Center Report, um, you know, the leading um, ethics journal in the world from 1976 to 1991, and a regular feature on public health and the law in the American Journal of Public Health from 1982 to 1992. And wait till you hear this. From 1991 to 2016, Professor Annis wrote a regular feature for four separate editors of the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the feature was called Health Law, Ethics, and Human Rights. Uh, I was so proud when I had my seventh or eighth New England Journal paper, and Professor Annis has more than 100 New England Journal papers. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, George Annis is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and a former member of the National Academy's Human Rights Committee. Uh, he's held a variety of government regulatory posts, including vice chair of the Massachusetts Board of Registration in Medicine, chair of the Massachusetts Health Facilities Appeals Board and chair of the Massachusetts Organ Transplant Task Force. It is with the greatest pleasure that I invite um, a colleague of mine from many, many years before, Professor George Annis. George. Mark, thank you very much. That was uh, much more than I needed or deserved, but I appreciate it a lot. It's great to see you and great to be with you and your colleagues today. Uh, I hope I say at least some things that uh, we can disagree with and we can talk about. Uh, I'm never happy unless I offend at least one person in my audience. Uh, today I'm going to talk about something I've been thinking about on and off, not constantly, uh, for at least the last 20 years. And you can help me figure out where this is going and why this, why these issues keep recurring. Uh, I call this talk Misunderstanding Standard of Care in National Emergencies. Uh, but it's more than that. It's not just misunderstanding standard of care. Uh, 
but it's misunderstanding the meaning of care, I think. Next slide. And I want to look at the question of how we define things uh, and how our definition directly affects what we see as reasonable, ethical medical care in the stand in this context of both usual care and research. And then finally, in the context of emergencies. Next slide. So I'll start probably the first thing that got me thinking about this a little bit was the very famous 076 trials in Africa in 1998. This has taken us back a ways. Uh, and uh, Mark just reminded me, this is the only time anyone, is, to my knowledge, has ever resigned from the editorial board of the New England Journal of Medicine, with two people resigned over even publishing an article about that criticized the 076 trials. And you, you recall, well, I don't know if you're, because some of you are too young to recall, but this was a placebo controlled uh, trial of uh, antiretrovirals uh, in pregnant women to see if they could uh, reduce or eliminate transmission, HIV transmission uh, to, their, to their babies. Uh, the rationale for a placebo arm for this trial was that, and this is true, that the standard of care in Africa is no care, that these women weren't getting any care. So that if I had to use a standard of care uh, as a comparison in my, in my trial, it would be ethically acceptable to use no care because that was the standard of care. Okay. Now that argument is so ridiculous on its face that it's hard to argue with. <laughs> As, as you know, the, the crazier arguments get, the harder uh, they get to respond to. QAnon is a classic example of that, right? Uh, how do you respond to a group of pedophiles uh, abusing children in the basement of a pizzeria in Washington, D.C.? I mean, it's just ridiculous on its face, but many, many people believe it. And many, many people believe, believe me, I was involved, <laughs> argued with a lot of them. Uh, that no care was standard of care uh, in Africa. And the reason Paul Farmer is there is because uh, his terrific new book on Ebola, uh, he does mention his, he doesn't mention its front page New York Times argument with uh, Médecins Sans Frontier or what care was in the Ebola epidemic uh, that recently ended, it looks like it came back again. In, in Russia, in, uh, in Africa. But what he writes is this, he says, uh, West Africans, including frightened clinicians, disliked their fates being ordered by those advocating a standard of care that in many cases didn't resemble care at all. And, and he was exactly right about that. Uh, that, uh, next slide, that care anywhere in the world uh, for dehydration would have been IVs. It's common, it's treatable, it uh, prevented death. Uh, yet these weren't used because these, and the ar argument was because they were Africans and they would put the staff at risk. Uh, okay, well, we'll argue, we'll see later whether you, whether you agree with that. But it's, my point I wanna make is that it is not uncommon, at least in Africa, for uh, people from the West to argue that no care is standard of care. Next slide. The next study uh, that we're gonna look at briefly is a support study. Uh, I've called it the, the most controversial study in the 21st century uh, that may not live up to that hype, but it was a, again, a randomized clinical trial, this time using very premature newborns uh, to compare two levels of oxygenation, a high level, so-called high level, and a so-called low level uh, to see if it could finally be determined uh, which one was best uh, for children. The research question was absolutely fine. You know, this is a big, this is a, 
uh, an important clinical question that had not been answered in the more than 50 years that uh, oxygen had been given to very premature newborns, sometimes causing blindness, sometimes uh, sometimes resulting in death, depending on uh, on the on the dose. Okay, so the way it was questioned, the, my only question about this study was the informed consent part. All right, how did you get? How do you ever get uh, mothers uh, to consent to experimentation on their extremely premature infants uh, right after birth? It's hard, and and to give the the group credit, there were a lot of refusals. So we know that they actually. Uh, tried to get informed consent. The problem was not trying to get informed consent. The problem was how they described the risks. And this was seen by the researchers and by almost all of the IRBs that reviewed this as, a, as no risk research. And the argument was it's no risk because it compares two types of usual care not standard of care, same idea, but two types of usual care. And because the infants could have got either one of these levels of oxygen outside of the research trial, that therefore there was, this was no risk research, even though the hypothesis was there was gonna be a difference in the death rate between these two arms. Right. Not, not that the death threats caused by the, the intervention necessarily, but it could be. So the second argument, this became a big argument, uh, was, well, they're not losing anything by having the trial randomized. Again, because either side is usual care. All right. And the only thing you could say, and I was one of the people who made this argument, that they were losing is the ability to ask their doctor and get the doctor, what do you think is best for my child? Okay. And the argument was that that was a nothing thing because we didn't have the data to answer that question. And therefore the doctor's view was uninformed and meaningless. Okay, and, and you may agree with that, but we'll talk about that. Anyway, our, our, the argument on the other side was just because doctors don't know everything doesn't mean they don't know anything. And uh, hopefully their medical school, their experience in residency and their experience as clinicians gives them at least some standing to have an opinion as to what may be the best, best arm for the child. And secondly, that this, information could be valuable to the parents and so they should have it as part of informed consent. Okay, so we'll, next slide. And this is also a long-winded argument uh, to, to highlight Jay Katz's uh, position, which is I think clearly right, uh, that this was all part of the therapeutic illusion. In this case, it was the doctors who had the therapeutic illusion, not the patients, uh, because they believe that research is treatment that the researcher is your, your physician and that the subject here is actually a patient, none of which were true. This was clearly research, <laughs> everybody agreed with that. Um, the physician did not act, the researcher did not act as your physician. Uh, he or she always followed the protocol and did not treat the patient as a patient, but treated them as a subject uh, in research. The application of which was to be guided exclusively by the protocol. Next slide. Uh, crisis standards of care. Uh, I wish I could take a poll. Uh, I, would, I would like to know if we could figure out a way to figure out how many of you have ever heard of crisis standards of care. And then the other half, I, then I want to know, we can do this in the questions and answers. Uh, what do you think crisis standards of care are? This is a relatively new concept. Uh, and I'm gonna argue that it is almost a contentless concept that it's very similar in its own way to the argument that no care can be standard of care 
And doctors don't know anything if it hasn't been validated in a randomized clinical trial. So crisis standard of care in COVID. Uh, I guess one, one reason I, I want to talk about this is because the National Academy of Medicine has made such a big deal about this. Uh, not only since their 2009 report, which was the first time they used the, the phrase, uh, which was done by, for the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, the Office of uh, Preparedness. Uh, but this year, they've had like a half a dozen meetings on crisis standards of care uh, directly related to COVID. Next slide. So in real life, the theory behind crisis standards of care is that in a crisis, the standard of care changes. Okay. Uh, that, by the way, is clearly wrong just as a matter of language. Uh, but it may be right in a different way. And I'm going to give people, give them a lot of leeway here. Uh, the standard of care in medicine and law is, except for informed consent, is exactly the same. And it never changes. All right. The standard of care is what would a reasonably prudent physician do in the same or similar circumstances? If there is a resource limitation, the standard of care is what would a reasonably prudent physician do in the face of this resource uh, compromise? It's a medical malpractice standard, which obviously bothers some physicians and some physicians thought that we had to change the standard of care in a crisis so I don't get sued, uh, like an immunity argument, okay? But that's not true either, all right? Standard of care is set by the medical profession. It's always, both in emergencies, in non-emergencies, in crises, in non-crises, what would a reasonably prudent physician do in the same or similar circumstances? And one of the horrible things about all this is the people on the National Academy of Medicine panel know this. They absolutely understand that, but they still don't want to, <laughs> they don't want to acknowledge it in the document. And I, I, you can tell me why. Uh, now, one of the things they say is no, some, you can't trust. Yes, that's true. That is the standard, but you can't trust judges. The judges could change their mind. And the case that they point to, Canterbury versus Spence, is a famous informed consent case. And in that case, indeed, the doctors asked the judge to say, whatever informed consent is, is whatever the doctors do, whatever doctors do, because doctors should always set their own standard of care, all right? And the court said, yeah, that's almost, that's generally true. But it can't be true when it comes to the rights of patients. You can't let doctors ignore the rights of patients. You can't let all doctors get together and say, we're not gonna get informed consent anymore. So informed consent goes away, all right? What the court said and what I think is right, uh, and you know what's hardcore medical ethics as well, is that patients have a right as human beings with their own body, their own bodily integrity uh, to decide whether or not to accept a medical or research uh, intervention based on whatever they want to do, but based primarily on their own view of what is good for them, okay? And the doctrine of informed consent, which requires physicians to make certain disclosures before asking for consent is based on the fiduciary nature of the doctor-patient relationship, because this is what patients expect and they deserve, and that it's not something doctors can disagree with, they can disagree with it, but they still have to get consent whether they disagree with it or not. So the more sophisticated view is the standard of care and medical standard of care is always what a reasonably prudent physician would do in the same or similar circumstances, except for the informed consent doctrine, which is based on patients' rights, not doctors' actions, okay? but you can see how people might get confused. Next slide. Uh, this is, this is uh, the front page of the New York Times a couple of days ago. You may, you may remember this. This was about 
uh, a specific hospital, Martin Luther King Hospital in Los Angeles, and how four times the death has four times the death rate from uh, COVID that the quote white hospitals have in the rest of Los Angeles. Uh, all our patients, virtually all our patients are Hispanic. Virtually all of them are poor, and uh, it's not the problem is not specific types of resources that aren't available. It's lots of resources aren't available, lots of staff's not available. And the Latino population simply doesn't get the same quality of care uh, as the white population in Los Angeles. And they, I think that uh, this is an article by uh, uh, Dr. Fink and I think she's nails it. Okay, next, next slide. So prior to COVID, there had been some work done on crisis standards of care all around the country, all fun, funded directly or indirectly by the Office of Preparedness in the Department of Health and Human Services. And virtually all of that literature, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, was about ventilator allocation. What are we gonna do when we run out of ventilators and we have to decide who gets the next ventilator? Let me say immediately, that's an interesting question. It's a very interesting question, all right? And it deserves, it deserves the research it got. It's not a standard of care question. It has nothing to do with standard of care. It's a triage question. Uh, it's, a, you know, some, sometimes you do have to decide uh, where you use scarce resources, all right? Does it change the standard of care? Doesn't affect the standard of care. The standard of care remains what would a reasonably prudent physician with your qualifications do in the same or similar circumstances, right? They may, and the, the point of a lot of these articles was to try to give doctors some guidance. Some of them went so far as to say, oh, we should set up separate committees, that the committee should make these decisions. Uh, and that the last person who should make this decision is the doctor, is the attending physician, because it will cause him or her great harm because they're not used to making decisions like this. Right, and they shouldn't have to make them. Well, it depends what you mean by decisions like this. Obviously, ventilator use is one of the most litigated medical, legal, and ethical questions uh, that there is, from Karen Ann Quinlan through Nancy Cruzan through the assisted suicide cases. We've got more law on how you decide to terminate treatment, how you decide to give treatment, and the bottom line is whatever the doctor and the patient decide together, rules. Now, the reason this became an issue is because it was hinted at and even stated that maybe there are gonna be some times when you're not gonna get the patient and the family's permission. Yeah, let me just say for now, we can talk about this. In the, that's never gonna happen in an American hospital. And Governor Cuomo basically said the same thing in the middle of the, uh, of the New York uh, problem. And it didn't, as far as we know, never happened. They're in the first, I guess we're in the third phase now, uh, the third uh, surge of COVID. We can talk about that more. My only point here is even though it was far and away the most discussed under crisis standards of care, didn't have anything to do with crisis standards of care uh, or, or uh, uh, standard of care itself. Next, next slide. So this is the National Academy of Medicine. And this drives me nuts because this is a good organization uh, I don't say that just because I'm a member of it. I am, but uh, but the, boy, did they get it? They get carried away with this. December 18th. That's really that's just a couple of months ago. They made an announcement. They joined several organizations, called for action to implement crisis standards of care. Again, we have no idea. They have no idea what a crisis standards of care are. It's a made-up term, all right. But they want you to implement it. Uh, and here's what they argued. They argued this is right from their press release and just. Not that usual for the National Academies to do press releases uh, about health policy. So they said the crisis is now governors, health departments, hospitals, and other healthcare sector partners must take immediate action to save lives by implementing crisis standards of care. There's all kinds of things wrong with that statement. Not the least of trying to figure out who's responsible for whatever these things are. Is it really governors? Is it really health departments? Is it really hospitals? And we've seen it all across the country, 
a number of states has implemented what they call crisis standards of care. Uh, I'm sorry to laugh because it's sad, because I don't think it gives you any information. And in many states, like my own state, Massachusetts, uh, in New York, hospitals have done it on, on their own level. Next, next uh, slide. Um, okay, so here's the definition, the current definition of crisis standards of care. Crisis standards of care occur when a disaster or epidemic results in sustained resource shortages that are severe enough to require a change in the usual manner of healthcare delivery that may increase the risk of poor outcomes. Okay, if you can understand what that says, then you can explain it to me right. or anybody else. Some of you may actually be operating under crisis standards of care and I, I feel bad for you, uh, but you can tell me if, it, if it's helpful uh, in the questions and answers. Next slide. So this is a really interesting article. Uh, which came out in May at the beginning of the of the, uh, of the uh, pandemic, and it's a it's a, from by very distinguished authors. Uh, it's an argument for crisis standards of care, and, and it ar argues that explicit crisis standards, grounded in ethical principles, will help clinicians define and understand when strict adherence to established resuscitation protocols may no longer be appropriate. So there's a lot of double talk in that, but basically what it says is maybe we have to change our CPR and DNR protocols for the pandemic to meet crisis standards of care. And I mean, people have been around this field as long as I have, have been dealing with CPR and DNR for almost 50 years. It's the, it's the one thing that well, maybe more than one, but it's really one thing ethicists have never been able to figure out and clinicians have never been able to figure out, which is why CPR is the only thing in medicine, the only thing in medicine, maybe you get something else from me, maybe you're taking, taking a pulse maybe, that doctors do routinely without consent, that you just do it, right? That's, that's ridiculous, by the way, uh, but we've kind of lived with it. And these authors argue that it's become standard of care <laughs> to, resusc to, to attempt resuscitation, even when you know it's gonna be futile. And so if we're gonna not do futile resuscitations during the pandemic, we need a whole new set of rules. We need crisis standards of care. Next slide. And here are the words they use for standard CPR. Standard practice, typical practice, usual practice, ordinary practice, fair practice, established practice. Trust me, these six adjectives are used in the same article for the same thing, which is an indication that they're not quite sure what they're talking about. Uh, for me, it's an indication CPR is just the wrong model to use. Number one, again, it's the only thing that we do without consent. Uh, and number two, I guess shows that ethicists aren't as influential as they think they are. We still haven't figured out how to do uh, DNR or DNAR properly in the hospital. Next slide. Now, you may recognize Sherry Fink again. She was the woman who did the, uh, did the New York Times article. She wrote this terrific book, which if you haven't read, I recommend it. Uh, Five Days at Memorial following the Katrina uh, hurricane disaster in New Orleans and the disaster at Memorial. Well, one of the things she pointed out in this book is that the doctors, all the doctors at Memorial, none of them had any idea what DNR meant. In fact, they believe that DNR meant don't treat anymore, that this person's gonna die. And so these persons were put at the end of the line to evacuate Memorial Hospital, just because they had DNR orders on them. Next slide. And that was wrong. And Sherry argues, of course, that was wrong. And one of the doctors, I forgot to tell you, actually, can you go back to that one? One of the doctors uh, was charged with murder in this case. This was a doctor who actually injected, uh, I think it was eight, it could have been 12 patients, uh, because uh, she didn't think they could be evacuated in time to say. Okay. The National Academy of Medicine points to that case, and that's the only case they can find, 
where doctors might have to worry about liability when they're using crisis in a, in a crisis, when they change medical practice in a crisis. Um, and we can talk about that. First of all, none of their uh, liability issues deal with crimes. This was a criminal issue, not a civil issue. And secondly, even in her extreme case, uh, the case was dismissed. Uh, and I, you know, for reason, you know, for reasonable, um, for reasonable reasons, sorry, which, which again, we can discuss a lot later. But this reignited the notion that we need preparedness and we need plans and we need uh, for horrible disasters like this. And again, that's not a problem. We can use plans. We do need plans. And no matter what we prepare for, it always seems to be the wrong thing. But it is not an argument for crisis standards of care. And uh, for those of you who read the American Journal of Bioethics, you'll know that Sherry Fink wrote a lead article uh, about six months ago on crisis standard of care uh, for the bioethics literature. And she concluded, <laughs> I almost wish I'd have made this conclusion myself, uh, that we'd probably be better off without, without them than with them. Okay, next, next slide. And of course, if you're dealing with rationing, which I think this is all about under different words, so about rationing and triage, where we're dealing with rationing and triage and where we really, really, really needed better rules and better guidance was distributing the vaccine, the coronavirus vaccine. We are, you know, and I have tremendous sympathy for everybody involved in this, but nonetheless, could we do a worse job? We had a, more than a year to think about this. We knew what the crisis was going to be. We knew what we were going to do. We knew it was going to involve rationing. And yeah, we, you know, we, no, we didn't do it. We didn't do it. Uh, next slide. So I'm wrapping it up. All right. Here's my conclusion, which I want to discuss. The crisis standard of care failed to improve emergency response and should be abandoned. The standard of care, as I've said many times, I'll say it again, though, is always the same. And using this term instead of standard of, is at best confusing. The institutional level that each hospital should have their own standards of care is simply wrong, all right? as is the state level. If we're going to have standard of care, a different standard of care, it should be at least national. I'd argue it should be international, uh, the way medicine is. Uh, that makes no sense that a patient's resuscitation uh, category is decided by which hospital they came to, all right, or which state they live in, all right? These should be uniform. Uh, informed consent cannot be waived by a group of physicians doing triage. They may be very distinguished physicians. They may do a nice job at triage. The law requires that you get the patient's consent to intubate them and to extubate them if it's not medically, has medically if it's medically indicated that they stay on. We didn't talk about these two things, but I'm happy to. Every time we get crisis standard of care, it's followed by the sentence, we have to do it now, shift from doing what's best for the patient to doing what's what's best for the greatest number. We gotta do the greatest good for the greatest number, uh, which only begs the question, how do you do that? First, is it true? Who said that? Certainly no legislature, no governor or no president said that. Uh, did doctors just get to make it up? We get to change the practice of medicine when there's a crisis, all right? Uh, and fine, finally, legal immunity is unnecessary and dangerous. And I'm happy to say it, virtually every physician I've talked to agrees with this. Uh, but nonetheless, that's the reason this whole notion of crisis standard of care started, that physicians were worried about legal immunity. Some physicians were worried about legal immunity with no data, by the way. If you want data, there's no data on this. Uh, and therefore thought that to get rid of that problem, we just change the standard of care because you can only sue a doctor who doesn't follow the standard of care uh, successfully and we'll get rid of it. All right, so I talked longer than I thought I was going to, I'm sorry. But you know, we still have plenty of time for questions and answers. So. Oh, oh, please don't apologize. The, um... <laughs> That, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm going to take the privilege of, of asking the first question, which is, um, I'm fascinated that, uh, and agree with you, that 
we all don't have to become utilitarians uh, just because we're in a pandemic, meaning that we don't have to only focus on the greatest good for the greatest number. And that I wouldn't equity, even know how to do that, as I said. <laughs> and, and nor would any of us as healthcare providers, um, uh, because it really takes away the whole issue of equity. And what's been fascinating, though, is, is the more recent shift in many of the, the writers and speakers about thinking about the whole issue of rationing, as you call it, or triaging, and that there has been now a great push towards issues of looking at health equity and how to achieve that. So for example, just to give you an example, here at our hospital, as we came to 1B, which was to allow for people over 65 after the healthcare providers got their vaccines, um, the decision was, since we didn't have enough for everybody over 65 in the city of Chicago, to actually focus on some of the areas hardest hit by COVID, meaning some of those um, from the lower socioeconomic or the uh, poverty uh, um, index. What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, my thoughts about that are, we're not, as a group, we're not taking uh, the rationing levels all that seriously, right? We made the first mistake, I think, again, this is me, uh, saying that we're gonna let each set, each state set its own rules. Now that makes no sense, all right? This is a national problem. The vaccines are produced nationally, they're purchased nationally. Now all of a sudden we're gonna distribute them to the states and say, you make up the ethical, pro ethical issue? No, I mean, that really, it doesn't work. So it's not surprising, we've got people going from state to state, we got all kinds of rumors going on, different, different things happening. Uh, now, does it make sense to give out vaccines to people who need them most? Yeah, of course it does first, but we have to decide, and we really never did decide whether we mean the people most at risk of dying if they contract the disease or people most at risk of contracting the disease because of their occupation. Uh, I mean, in, in a prominent hospital that I won't name, uh, although it's, I don't know why not, a Boston Medical Center, uh, makes the argument that their physicians aren't at risk at all because they take proper precautions. So they're safer than anybody else. So then they shouldn't get the vaccine first. They should get it last, right? If we're doing it for people who are most at risk of death, because that group is not, all right? But that's not your question. Your question was, can we, can, can we take equity into account here? And should we take equity into account? And that was the, the slide I showed you, Sherry Fink's article about the LA, about Martin Luther King Hospital, which is a disaster. Uh, and people dying at a much higher rate uh, than anywhere else, uh, basically because they're Latino and they live in poor in a poor area. And shouldn't they have, should get some priority in, in vaccination? I think the answer is yes. Uh, on the other hand, you can make an argument for lots of people. I would make the equity argument, but if you know, if you wanted to stick with uh, you know the question of just uh, the survivability argument, they win there too. They're they're probably more at risk than anybody else of dying of the disease if they get of COVID if they get it. So, I think you can justify giving it to them for a number of reasons. But certainly, uh, you know, equity is a good one. The, the frustrating thing about to, to bring it back to crisis standard of care. Uh, when these guys are writing about crisis standard of care now, they say, oh, well, we have to add that you can't discriminate against uh, people with handicaps. You can't discriminate against the poor. You can't discriminate about on the basis of race. That's brand new. When they wrote about crisis standards of care 10 years ago or even a year ago, equity wasn't an issue. Equity has become like a popular hot issue just in the last year or two, I think. So now we have to do equity too. Okay. Well. I would say that that's improved. Um, I, I want to read a comment from Gretchen Schwarzy and then we'll have Mark um, ask his question. But Gretchen wrote this and she's going to be quoting from Alta Charo. I completely agree with nearly everything you said. Alta Charo is the only person who's given me some insight on why the legal protections might be necessary. So she's looking at the whole issue of, uh, of the legal immunity. She says it's not just... Um, she says, it's not just winning the lawsuit, it's the bringing of the lawsuit, but this is costly for so many. So if there is a way to head that off, for example, by saying it was crisis standard of care, and so it's okay to keep people in the hallway because we didn't have a room for them, not letting people sue for their loved one being in the hallway, Alta's 
example, saves a ton of time and money and angst and all that other stuff. How would you like to respond? Yeah, I, you know, that's kind of a made up thing. I don't know, I, I mean, unless there are losses for that, I don't know. Um, but yeah, normally it's hard, I know it's hard for physicians to believe this, but people don't sue doctors. And when they sue, they lose. You know, there's no set. It's literally true what I told you. Dr. Poe, uh, the, the, the New Orleans pr physician who lethally injected a series of patients during Katrina, is literally the only physician who's been sued for emergency response. And the only one. Uh, you know, do we want, do I want to see doctors get sued for, you know, behaving what even sometimes even I would call heroically? Of course not. I don't think they will. You know, doctors worried. You know, during my whole career, and it's a pretty long career, 50 years, about uh, getting sued for stopping by the side of the road and rendering assistance. And they insisted that every state, and every state did basically, pass a Good Samaritan law, uh, which held them, uh, you know, not responsible, not legally responsible for acting in good faith, which is something less than, uh, uh, you know, extreme negligence. There never was a case. There never was a case. It was a made up problem. There never was a case of a doctor, except on Dr. Kildare. Some of you are old enough to remember that TV show. There never was a case in reality of a doctor being sued for acting as a good Samaritan. That means not billing someone and helping somebody because Americans want doctors to help. It's just, it's a made up thing. All right, if you, you know, I know, I know Governor Cuomo said you should, you're not gonna get sued in New York, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe, maybe not. All right, anyway. Yeah, I just don't buy it. Mark. I don't buy it. It's a problem. I think it's a made up. Most of these things are made up problems. It's remarkable how well the healthcare system, which is dysfunctional as can be, how well it's functioned for the last year. I mean, you do, you actually do it. I, I just, I watch it, just comment on it. But um, yeah, I think, I really think the last thing you have to worry about is malpractice litigation. And I know you don't want to be sued. I know you believe you're going to win. You will win. Uh, and I don't blame you for not wanting to be sued. But, uh, but I often think of my, uh, my colleague, uh, Doe Danner. He's deceased now, but he used to, he was a defense lawyer. And he said, he always says to his physician, <laughs> to his physician clients who he's defending, think of me as your physician. <laughs> I'll take care of you. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> And I think that's sometimes not the physician you want, but nonetheless, that's certainly how physicians <laughs> deal with their patients. And I think that's how uh, good malpractice lawyers deal with their medical clients too. And then properly so. Mark, your uh, turn. With your permission, I'm gonna go back to 2013. When, okay, and, that's not too far back. But when you were working at the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and you talked about the support study in West Africa and how it, um, how it helped bring uh, Paul Farmer uh, from Haiti to Rwanda, um, where, where my son was very close to him, uh, ah. uh, working, and my son's a non-physician, but, but a great admirer of, of Paul Farmer. Um, but, but, but I wanna say that, that the support study went on in the US and and England and Australia, uh, New Zealand, Canada, all over. All true. Yep. And, um, in the U.S., in the U.S., I, I want to bring bring your attention to the fact. I'm sure you know it that the OHRP, the Office for Human Research Protection, determined that the consent process um, for the study violated federal regulations by failing to inform parents of quote, reasonably foreseeable risks of death and blindness of their premature, usually 26 to 29 week old um, infants in those days, 26, 29. The New York Times strongly agreed with the OHRP calling these failures, failures startling and deplorable. However, the New England <laughs> Journal of Medicine strongly disagreed and they found that the consent forms were adequate and that the OHRP was, quote, 
casting a pall over the conduct of clinical research. I want to know where you came down on this as, as well, a, you know, a journal at that time. I mean, I thought this, I thought it was just horrible, but I made a decision, which I think was wrong now in retrospect, not to write about this because because Jeff got so involved, the editor got so involved in it, I think wrongly involved. Uh, it's not the reason I stopped writing for the New England Journal, but it came about at about the same place. I was horrified at the position the journal took there. And uh, Ruth Macklin, as you may know, put together a group of ethicist taking the position, the old harps position, and rightfully so, I think. Uh, but, uh, and the New England and Journal published their letter, but not in, uh, not in the printed version. They only published an electronic version. So if you weren't paying attention, you still didn't know that there was any dispute about, uh, about what happened. But uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, Jeff Drazen, the editor, was not happy with me because I, I publicly spoke out about the, about the study. And uh, even though I didn't write about it in the, in the journal, because I thought, I don't know why, I, did, I, th I thought it would be inappropriate. I mean, I'm not that important a person there. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that was bad. That was bad stuff. That was, yeah. uh, it, you know, but yes, but unusual, unusual for the journal. The journal usually does a lot better than that. Right. Th thank you so much. Thank you. No, thank you for that. The, um, so, well, let me push you a little bit on the support study uh, and distinguishing between the risks of being a preemie 24 to 25 weeks who if isn't in the study is also at the risk of blindness and death. And so what, at what point do we start saying that some of the risks that we're talking about in the research setting are actually the risks of clinical care as well? And how do, how do we not blur the lines? Well, the lines are blurred. I wouldn't just disagree with you. I mean, uh, you know, I used a long time ago, I used to there's research and there's treatment and uh, Judy Swayze convinced me, yeah, there is. And then at some point they converge, you know, at some point you're in the gray area. And, no, and absolutely, she's definitely right. Uh, the real question for me is how do you convey that to the patients, patient research subjects, to these mostly young women, very young women having their first child and horrified that uh, it's premature and very fragile. You know? And I think that's very difficult to do, but it doesn't mean it's not a research subject, it's clearly a research subject, uh, a research study, and clearly it's got risks, but you're right. Being a newborn, it's got risks of its own. So you're asking really, I mean, I'm not to put words in your mouth, but really what you're, the point you're making and whether you wanna make it or not, is that it's virtually impossible, and I made this point too, uh, for anybody to win a lawsuit based on the death, blindness, or other disability of those children because you can't prove causation. It just can't be proved. You have to prove causation to win a lawsuit. And indeed, these suits were dismissed, the, the few that were brought to case court were dismissed on the causation issue because you couldn't find a physician who was willing to testify under oath is that being in this study is what caused this child's blindness or this child's death. Because that's not true. It was being extremely premature that caused it. Um, well, well, so that gets back then to... And, and that's what, kind of... I'm just, how do, do we give, in a sense, then two consents to these families? One is, you have a newborn. We're going to take care of your newborn. And your newborn has a chance of dying or being blind. We want to put them in a research study. We're going to change the level of oxygen randomly. And your child still has a risk of dying or being blind. I mean, I guess, I guess one of the reasons I wrote the letter on the other side of Ruth Macklin or signed on to the other letter. Oh, was, you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't uh, remember that. I didn't. No, that's okay. And, and I, I've, I've been torn. So uh, there are days that I, I'm willing to switch sides, but I just <laughs> want to push on how do we, at what, how much of our clinical risks do we really have to incorporate into a research risk consent? I mean, it gets to your point that there's no such thing as crisis standard of care. There's standard of care. And what we do in a crisis is we have to deal with limitations. In a sense, what we do in the research has to do with the limitations of what we can do clinically as well. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I you know, I, think, I don't think the research study 
and how you set it up uh, is is problematic. It's not that problematic. The problematic thing was just not explaining to, to patients uh, the risks. Now, what you say is true. They'd have to be out of their mind not to know the risks or not paying attention. No, no, I actually don't think they have to be out of their mind. I just think what they have to realize, though, is that those same risks hold whether they're in the research or not. No, no, I understand. I, just, I, I get that. I get that. But they obviously know that their newborn is in trouble. Or ought yeah. to know that, yes. Unless, unless they're very, very medicated, you know, that they, they know exactly. No, it's a, and it's a very stressful time, and, you know, and a I mean, really stressful time. You know, I, I wrote a, long, uh, a longer piece about this in the legal literature with my daughter, uh, who also gave birth to a preemie. <laughs> Uh, no, thankfully, not in not uh, not in as bad a shape as these as these uh, research subjects, but but I think but you know I thought she had some insights as to what you how you make a decision as a patient now uh, a, a mother of a of a newborn to volunteer for research. Volunteer is even the right word there, you know? right? Yeah. yeah, very complicated. So very, well, not very complicated. I agree with that. Although ultimately I come down to the side that the informed consent was poorly done. And, and it was uh, the people I blame most for this, by the way, are the IRBs. I mean, what, what point I've made is why do we even have IRBs if they're not going to take a study like this seriously? Uh, while I'm waiting to see if other comments come in, I, I just want to share that uh, some, the uh, rest of the individuals are not able to to talk out loud, so they have to write their questions. Uh, guess, but yeah. you have a fan here, Peter Angelos, who's one of the associate directors of the McLean Center, who just wants to say thank you that he's been enjoying hearing from you since he was a first year medical student. Well, isn't that sweet? Thank you. And um, that's it. We really don't have a lot of questions. Mark, did he just win us all over or was he that's hard to believe because i said a lot of controversial things okay well so since we have some more time and no one else is taking questions i'm just going to monopolize because i have go questions. Ahead. so i i want to go back to the 076 study i agree with you that they were not offered standard of care they might have been offered the standard of practice in the country <laughs> where they were but that's not adequate um but i want to push you if the standard of care is something that will never be offered, does it make sense? I think you're frozen. So, so the question is, what if the standard of care is never going to be offered? I mean, what 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 patients were getting in the United States, for example, which was uh, three to four doses of uh, of of medicine before and during childbirth. Uh, and that was just too expensive. Well, two things to say about that. One, uh, my colleague Leonard Lenz and I wrote a piece together uh, on what we call economic experiments. And our, our argument here was, if you believe it, it's just too expensive to do that. This is not a, it's not a study about medical interventions. You know what medical interventions work. It's, a, it's you just can't afford it. So the study is really uh, a study of economics. It's how much can we afford? What can we give? And I was willing, probably too willing, uh, to say, no, you don't have to do 076 as, uh, as the comparison, but you have to do something active as a comparison, all right? Doesn't have to be the most expensive thing in the world. I agree with that, but it can't be nothing. You can't go to these women and say, we're gonna put you in a research trial and you know, you're gonna be randomized and you may get uh, one treatment or another treatment. No, you're not gonna get, you may get one treatment or nothing. And that's not what they were told by the way. Even if they, I, I mean, I don't think that trial should have been done if that was the real thing, but at least the women who were, the New York Times went over and interviewed a bunch of women and wrote about it on the front page. And at least the ones they wrote about said, they assumed they were getting medical treatment. The person coming to them, getting consent, had a white coat on, and that's all, they weren't used to getting medical treatment at all. So that's what they just, that was their assumption. And uh, so whatever else, again, my primary concern in most of these studies is with the informed consent protocol, that people know what they're getting into and aren't being just taken advantage of, or just being used literally as guinea pigs. And I th think 
we should have stopped doing that a long time ago. Well, you have your, uh, you're, you're muted. muted. Bob Shung, who's a, uh, I started with, I agree. Bob Shung, who is a psychiatrist here in Chicago, previously at, at the university here, writes, why are doctors so anxious, paranoid about being sued? Is medical <laughs> education slash training so unforgiving? What are your hypotheses? I, you know, it's a great question. Yeah. The, uh, Someone at the school is collecting uh, uh, rejects and trying to teach uh, teach the younger faculty that everybody gets rejected. It shouldn't let it kill you. Uh, and I, I decided to write something for that. I didn't know this. Uh, the first article I ever wrote for the New England Journal of Medicine was rejected by uh, uh, Inglefinger, Franz Inglefinger, very famous fellow. Uh, and he didn't just reject my article. He wrote a two-page single-spaced response to it, say, <laughs> say that, uh, so even though he said that the reviewers liked your article, but I didn't, and I'm not going to publish it, and let me tell you why, and he went boom, 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 me, 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 and it was an article about medical malpractice, which is why I bring this up, and I realized from that day on uh, that physicians look at medical malpractice a lot differently than lawyers do. Lawyers look at it as just part of life. You know, it's not a big deal and you're gonna get through it and we'll defend you and all this stuff. And, but, uh, but I, I, I changed two things I did because of that, because of Inglefinger's letter. Number one, I never wrote about medical malpractice in the New England Journal. You know, I've written lots of articles and did never wrote it, just said, not worth it. Let somebody else write about that. And number two, uh, and I taught medical school for about 40 years. And uh, in my, what was usually just a, a eight to 10 session uh, health loss course, uh, I began, I always began with malpractice. And I told them not because I thought it was the most important thing, but because they would think it was the most important thing. And I wanted them to get it out of their mind, All right? And one of the things we talked about was Good Samaritan. I said, you know, you may, be walking home today and see someone uh, passed out you know, on the street. And you may wonder, you will wonder, gee, am I gonna get sued if I, st if I stop and help this person? And I try to teach them, they should always wanna stop and help. All right, that's part of what being a doctor is, all right? And if they're worried about being sued, not only is there the Good Samaritan, but forget the Good Samaritan. Their standard of care is what would a reasonably prudent first year medical student do in the same or similar circumstances. And I tell them that is the lowest standard of care there is, and they all meet it already. And mostly they seem to understand that. But it's also true. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a medical student being sued for help trying to help somebody? Even if they hurt them, which they probably would like, I don't want to say they're going to do that. But, you know. No, it's just, you know, I mean, well, I, I, mean I, I don't get sued, but I, I get that. I get the thing. It's, it's bad to be sued. It's a miserable goddamn experience. And it's hard for doctors not to take it personal. I also spent like six years on the licensing board here in Massachusetts and got to understand that doctors take practicing medicine very personal and they take criticism personal it's not we're not even though the lawyer said no not criticism it could be anybody it's not you we're not, we're not after you it happens to be you but the language we use applies to everybody you know the, the horrible things we say about people just to file a lawsuit about what you did what horrible thing how negligent you were how you know just you know you didn't care about your patient etc i want yeah i have to say that um knowing colleagues who have been sued, it's not just that. It's okay. also the, um, I think, and this gets to part of Bob's question as well, the fact that our colleagues are very unforgiving. Uh, when people hear that a colleague has been sued, there's this sort of, I don't want to go near them. I, it might be contagious type thing. So there's a lot of there social- There is some of that. I'm just, I just find that so hard to believe, but I believe There it. is a lot of social peer pressure um, 
a really negative that happens when somebody gets sued, even if they did the right thing and you're gonna get them off and everything else. Um, and, and that's, um, which is why his question has that double layer of, yeah. is it- Which, is, which is remarkable in that they have no respect for lawyers. I mean, lawyers who sue doctors, you know, they hate lawyers who sue doctors. And so that they would let the, the lawyer take out one of their colleagues like that. I mean, I certainly see it. If you're sued multiple times, there's something there. You don't get sued multiple times. Most doctors never get sued. So they can be holier than thou and say, oh yeah, you know, you got sued. So you're not as good as me. I don't get, anyway, it's a problem. Medical malpractice is a problem. I think anything we can do to make the experience better because that's supposed to be you know we're not supposed to punish you it's not a criminal thing it's not to punish you it's to compensate the person who you injured it's to pay for their injury that's what it's for only secondarily is it any kind of a quality uh, so this conversation led to a lot of comments um one of them it was asking wasn't dr Pooh personally sued in civil court and do you know the status of those cases uh she was, uh, but only after the criminal case was uh, dismissed. And I don't know the status of that case. I, it should be easy. I should, I should have looked it up before today, but I did. I'm sure it's on, uh, and then an on anonymous, the internet. Anonymous attendee said, I believe the contingency payment model for barristers in America contributes to the huge volume and high insurance premium for medical practice. practice. This commission-based barrister compensation model is something America takes for granted, but is illegal in many other jurisdictions. Do you think no, that has something to do with it? it? It does. The reason we have, you know, I don't have to tell you this. The reason we have the contingency fee system is to protect patients. That patients can't afford to bring lawsuits. Injured parties can't afford to bring lawsuits. Uh, is it problematic? It can definitely be problematic. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you have to get a third of a million dollar verdict. For it. Well, I think there should be limits on how much you can, you can uh, that a attorney can take from, from the final settlement. Uh, on the other hand, we had you know, so many poor people in this country who simply couldn't even think about bringing a lawsuit, no matter how horribly they were injured, that you need some mechanism that permits them to get their day in court. And this is the best one that we have, but yeah, does it have problems? Yeah, it does have problems. Great. Mark, do you have any last questions or words of advice? Because uh, otherwise we've gone through our chat session. Oh, the other big problem with malpractice, and you know this, is that you have to be really badly injured to get a lawyer to take your case. <laughs> You've got to be in the million dollar range or it's just not worth it. Mark, you're on mute. Mark, <laughs> you're talking to yourself. Sorry, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thanks. Um, I, I, I love the talk, and, um, and the talk went so beautifully with the title of the talk, which, um, which I forgot to say when, when I introduced you, George. Um, but correct me if I've got it wrong. Uh, the title that we had was Double Double Toil and Trouble misunderstanding standard of care. That's um, it, you got it. Yeah. And, and uh, there has been a long time since I read Macbeth and heard, heard the witches say uh, double, double toil and trouble, <laughs> warning Macbeth that as he continued to kill people in order to become king, um, he was gonna get into trouble. And, and I'm, and, and the issue here is that that's not what doctors ought to do <laughs> to, to, to make the, their success. That, that is to, to, to kill people on their way to success. Uh, and the witches knew that it would not work out well for Macbeth. And, uh, and I think that applies also to, to doctors. <laughs> all right, very nice. All right, on that note, I wanna say thank you on behalf of all of us here at the McLean Center and those from around the world. We actually had comments from people from Pakistan as well as uh, other parts of uh, the globe. That's great. The beauty of uh, doing this on Zoom is that we can have a much more international audience than if we were all in, a, uh, in an auditorium. 
So thank you very much. I know the fellows will be resuming at 1.30 with Professor Annis. Anything else I'm supposed to say, Mark? No, no, that's All good. right, thank you very much. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank, thank you. George. Bye-bye.